Traditions, values, culture. These are the things that help us remember where we came from. It's time for Family Heritage Stories. I'm Doug Jessup. And I'm Nisha Daguerin, and welcome to Family Heritage Stories, where we talk about what makes us, things like traditions, values, and culture. How are these things passed down from generation to generation? Through deeds, through words, and through stories. There are reasons why people celebrate Swiss days or Day of the Dead. It's one word, culture. You've got a longer name than Makisi, okay? I do. You know, I, I know that most people call you Makisi Tapa, but I'm pretty sure that was not your given name. It wasn't. My, my full name is Manu Makisi Tapa Atoutai. Sure, say that three times. <laughs> We're at a cool venue and we had you perform music for us today. And um, I'm gonna have you give a shout out to the people and, and this is a clue, okay? <laughs> so, so where are we today? We are in Taylorsville, Utah at Bonfire, the Gava Lounge, most epic Gava Lounge you've ever seen. Okay, there's a shameless plug. Okay, so <laughs> Kaba, hmm. okay, so what is Kaba? Kava is um, a ground up root of a plant that we, that we grow in Tonga. It's, uh, and then we use it for traditional uh, ceremonies. And we, well, here we gather around it and talk stories. There you go. Well, I like talking stories. So now, so you talk Tonga. So obviously you, you have Polynesian culture. So uh, have, were you born in Tonga or where were you born? No, I was born here in Utah, Salt Lake City. Okay, and then have you been to Tonga? Yes, I have. Tell me about it. Um, it was it was a good and bad experience for me. I got sent out there because I got in a little bit of trouble here in high school, uh, and I got sent out there to be disciplined, and and it turned out to be one of the best decisions that my dad ever made. <laughs> so you're in Tonga, then then you come back. Okay, your dad made a good decision. What happened from there? Um, I just came back and and basically fell into music. Oh. And music basically saved my life for as far as me choosing the right people to be around. Describe the kind of music that you perform. Um, it's, it leans a lot towards reggae. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of music. But I, I try and, and, and change it up uh, as much as I can. Now, do you perform your own songs or covers or what, what's kind of the I can do both. I, I, I've written many songs and, and I do covers as well. One of the songs was called Gates, and it's featuring one of my good friends, Shona Toki. Um, the song basically touches on uh, just the struggles of everyday life and, and how nowadays you just see, you see mostly pain, and, and we're trying to go past that. In one of the verses, um, I talk about how you drive past the girl and, and she's, she's just going through it, and, and all you do is, all you're gonna do is just drive past her and not really think about her pain but you don't know that it's raining and it's pouring in their world. And that's pretty much what Gates is and then it's pretty an uplifting song. Now, that re reminds me, from what I understand, you and your band are doing some humanitarian work. Um, and it seems like it's kind of tied to the people that are sometimes forgotten. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we try to feed the homeless as much as we can, you know, basically on Saturdays. So if you guys here, come and help us. Yeah. Second South. We just tried to give back, you know, because I, I feel like we all know, we all felt that feeling of, of not having anything and, and not having help. So I just want to give that back. Well, me and my crew, we want to give that back to, that feeling back to people yeah. that feel hopeless. You know what I'm saying? You met a young woman and then you have a young girl. I do. Okay, so tell me about your family. Um, I'm married to Sehe Lasa Valai Tapa Atoutai. We have a daughter named Fae, Fae Kivavau Tapa Atoutai. They're just everything to me. Yeah. Now, Fae, from what I understand, is named after someone very special. She's named after my mom, um, the best lady I've ever known. <laughs> well, the one performance that I think she would really be honored to, to be a part of is the one that had your daughter and 
the rest of your your family yeah so now that one was in a different language yes so I'm presuming that was Tongan yeah okay what what was it called and what does it mean uh, the song is called Fola Fola and it's basically uh, about the story of Noah and the song is asking it, it God tells Noah you know to do his job and make the ark and the song basically calls for like uh, us asking Noah to leave the door open for us to and wait to wait you know before the flood comes sounds like you that your faith is extremely important to you oh definitely definitely that's what gets me through every day is my belief in God and, and knowing that the strength he gives me allows me to do everything I do to me everyone has a story and sometimes the stories are told through music if there was one overreaching story for your music, what would it be? Hope. Hope that I, I hope that my music can give hope to those that are hopeless. You know, and, and, and just bring a smile to you, you know, and, and basically just help you. If, if it helps you 10 minutes of your day, mm -hmm. I think I did my job. If it made you smile, if it made you slow down, if you're going too fast, you know, I think, I think if my music can bring meaning to every minute of your life, I think that'll be what might the impact of my music can be. What is your favorite song in the Tongan language that you could sing right now, right here? Um, it's called E Otua. What's that mean? Uh, it's just calling out to God. Okay, you wanna give us a sample? Yeah. E Otua ta ta Ki au fakau lo e mama i haku lo to pe angau i au ko e feto ngi ngi la ko ko e ai ma lo hi ma e ma fi ma fi. How do you want to leave your mark? I want to know, be known as someone that was kind. There's something special about the bond between a grandparent and a grandchild. How would you answer this question? Tell me about your grandma and grandpa. Uh, yeah, my mother's mother was named Margaret, but she always went by Yvonne, and I thought that was kind of a, a unique name because I don't know too many Yvonnes. Uh, but she had red hair, and for the most of the time that I knew her, she had a curly red wig, and I never saw her without her wig, and that was just a big part of her. Uh, but I remember uh, visiting her. She lived in Denver, and uh, she loved to play cards. So she actually taught me how to play rummy and uh, a few different games, and she just always loved playing cards, and uh, she was a great cook, too. Her hubby. Uh, she was married to a man named Raymond August Nelson, and he was an electrical engineer, and he actually worked on the Hoover Dam in his uh, young adulthood. And one of my first memories of him was we were at a family reunion, and he was doing the trick where, you know, sometimes you'll say, got your nose, or his trick was, uh, my finger's gone. And his finger was actually gone because when he was uh, working on the Hoover Dam, he had actually had an accident with a, a ring uh, that had amputated his finger, and so I always knew him as, as the grandpa with, with nine fingers. Um, but he loved, he got a kick out of it with all of his grandkids. He would play games with it. <laughs> yes, okay, wow. <laughs> so let's, let's look at, uh, that's mom's side, how about dad's side? Uh, I didn't know my uh, dad's parents as well. They were advanced in age when I was growing up. I was the youngest of a large family, but uh, my father's father was named Elton Vernon, uh, which is also my dad's name. And uh, they lived in Vernal, Utah, or just outside of Vernal in a little town called Mazer. And he was a farmer and a surveyor, and uh, they had uh, various animals. And, and when I knew him, he was confined to a wheelchair, and uh, he passed when I was about eight years old. How about your dad's mom? Uh, he was married to a woman named Edna Grace Ashby, and uh, she was kind of right with her husband, living the farm life, and uh, she loved to, to chat and to visit, and uh, I don't remember a lot about her, and, and she passed when I was about 13. 
The last words that my grandfather said were, please remember me. This is Doug Jessup. It would be my honor to help you share your story with a private in-studio interview with a video for you to keep. Go to FamilyHeritageStories.com for pricing and to schedule your interview. Everyone has unique skills and interests. How did you get into your occupation? And uh, really, it's a very cathartic thing to be able to have a person who's able to make something that you've taught them a craft, and then they're able to take that piece and go give it away or sell it. And it's really rewarding to facilitate that, that craft for people. So what's this gentleman doing here? So I've got Brendan, one of my uh, longest term employees running the uh, hand crank bellows, pushes air in through the tube here, up underneath the fire into the coal. I've currently got a about a two and a half pound uh, hammer that I'm working on for my uh, Junior Smith program. What kind of metals are you going to be forging here? So right now it's actually a little chunk of a uh, old antique piece of axle oh, wow. <laughs> that we've uh, pulled off and cut up. It's just about the right dimension to form into these hammers. Um, but we do everything from mild steel, construction grade stuff, all the way up to really high end super steels um, in some of our higher end knives. What's, when you're at these shows, what's the question you get asked the most often? What is your favorite thing to make? And the answer is? Blacksmiths. Literally. Oh, okay. I got that. Okay, you know. Okay. I walked into that one. Um, so what kind of things, you know, you've got things for sale as well here. Yep, but absolutely. What are the things that people are attracted to? So everybody like. comes over and sees all the real swords that are made, that are a historic weight um, with some additional handcraft on the, uh, you know, we're blacksmiths wow. as well as bladesmiths. So we've got the hand forged pommel here, our hand forged cross guards, and then of course all the blades are also hand forged from just a regular bar of steel, not unlike that piece there. So you're saying, okay, so people can come buy these. People can come buy them, but, but you're, more you're importantly what we want to do is we want to teach you to make them. Wow. If you get to make your own heirloom sword for your wife or your groomsman or your pastor, it's uh, kind of a unique thing to be able to be a part of. What was the first car you drove? We're hopping on a train to explore the world at your leisure. We're going to go see the world's first patented motor car. We're going to the Mercedes-Benz Museum at Stuttgart, Germany. Carl Benz developed his first stationary gasoline engine, a one-cylinder, two-stroke unit that ran for the first time on New Year's Eve back in 1879. Carl Benz, filed for his first patent in January of 1886, described as a, quote, vehicle powered by a gasoline engine. It's interesting to note that the first car he built was a three-wheeled vehicle. The idea of a motor car wasn't getting much traction with the public, and so Carl's wife, Bertha Benz, really was her name, took their two teenage sons for a ride to her hometown and back, about 180 kilometers. FYI, Carl did not know that his wife did this, but it became the world's first long distance journey in automobile history and silenced doubters and sparked the success of the automobile. In 1893, Carl patented the double pivot steering system. Well, why is that important? Because it made four wheeled cars like this Benz Velo possible. Here's some trivia for you. The name Mercedes came from the daughter of a client that commissioned a race car to be built. The Mercedes Star logo has been used since 1909, and it stands for, you ready? Mobility on land, on water, and in the air. I know you're not supposed to have favorite kids, but I have to admit, the Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Gullwing unveiled as a racing car prototype back in 1952, oh man, took my breath away. On a side note, Chad Booth told me that one of his neighbors used to have one. Lucky. The company grew in the 1950s on the strength of commercial vehicles and the fact that there was a near monopoly on the manufacturing of diesel engines. The race car section of the Mercedes-Benz Museum looked like the coolest Hot Wheel collection ever, even from a distance. Up close, oh man, even better. Mercedes continues to be associated with luxury brands. The goal for the future is to be a major player in the electric vehicle space. They're also surprisingly good at putting cars on balls. From the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart, Germany, I'm Doug Jessup. What are your family stories? I'm Nisha Degaring. I'm Doug Jessup. It would be our honor to help you share your stories with an in-studio interview. We take out the bloopers, add in your pictures, and give you a digital video to keep. To schedule your interview, go to FamilyHeritageStories.com. 
do you want to be remembered? I'm with Lorraine Bowder. We share a whole bunch of different interests, and one of those that I would say is we're both plant geeks. Of course. Yeah, that's, that's all the stuff. <laughs> so I'll, I'll let you give a shameless plug as to why we know each other plant-wise. Well, as you know, every day is a great day at Mill Creek Gardens, and when you come in, you are always lit up like a banner, and you're searching for those beautiful plants for your yard as well as for the set here at the station. And, you know, besides every day is a great day at Mill Creek Gardens, there's also plants and people and connections to be made, and that's part of the mission statement of my life is to connect people and plants and do it in the funnest way possible. And you definitely do that. Was there somebody that helped you get that spark of loving plants? Well, there was many, but there's just a, a wonderful experience I've had with my grandmother in her gardens. And she had the most amazing garden with things like hibiscus, bleeding hearts, um, cranes bill wild geranium, burning bush, which is the beautiful fall color mm -hmm. big shrub. She had a small hedge of those in her yard. And um, she planted bulbs and it, it was every memorial weekend we would go to her house after saving the tins of the cans for a few weeks beforehand and we would go to her home she would be picking the flags or we call them iris mm -hmm. um, she would be picking the snowball bushes mm -hmm. and if there was some roses up by then we'd be picking roses and if it was a, a normal year there usually would be some available and many other plants from her garden, peonies especially. Mm -hmm. And we would be putting bouquets together with some greenery. There was always some juniper there, some holly. And we would create these beautiful bouquets to take to the cemeteries. And usually we would travel to Logan up oh. there to see that, Centerville. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be a, a wonderful experience with my grandmother. Also, there was many times when I spent time in her yard running around and she had these strawberries. <laughs> oh, yeah. She planted them under her rose bushes of all places mm -hmm. as a ground cover. And we had many a morning of fresh strawberries with our cereal because of her. And she would make the fresh preserves. Oh, yeah. And we were right there with that. And she was from Danish descent. And so it was just this great opportunity to know my grandmother better and a few years ago we had a family reunion and before that reunion that week that whole week I was thinking of grandmother and all these plants and didn't even realize what the huge influence she was and I happened to have a greenhouse in my backyard that's about 1400 square feet and I had sure no problem everybody's got one you know, else, right <laughs> it's one of my hobbies too is I do it for a living but it's also this hobby yeah and and I got this like inspiration Lorene you need to take some plants to this family reunion up in Albion Idaho and share these with your family and it ended up that as I loaded my Suburban with everything I needed and then I filled it with plants. Um, many trays of lilies like this mm -hmm. lily right, right. here uh -huh. and Cranesbill and iris and daylilies um, and bleeding hearts and it was it was summertime and I had propagated these not knowing that's what I was going to do with some of them and I got up there and we everybody was curious what are those plants for I waited till after the family meeting mm -hmm. and then I said I, I've got some things to say about these plants everybody's curious about them right mm -hmm. let me tell you about grandmother's influence in my life for plants and I was able to go through for a few minutes and just share where they were growing in her garden and right. how I learned about them and then I said okay aunts and uncles, you get to choose first. Choose a handful mm -hmm. to go home to your garden and then cousins join in and then your families join in. And by the time we were finished, there was only a small handful left. And by the time we left, they were all gone. And the cool thing was is since then, I've had a few texts and phone calls from cousins saying, I'm in my garden and I'm looking at the plants you gave mm -hmm. me for grandmother's garden and thank you. And right. it just brought us together even just for a fun moment. What was her name? Florence Lavere Sorensen Sorensen. Wow. Beautiful. There's one plant that you introduced me to that I have to admit is now my favorite. Um, and it's an Ito uh, peony peony. Yes. Um, and to me, to think that that plant, I hate to say this, but that plant's going to outlive me. Okay? Yes, it will. Those so are marvelous. When, when is a plant more than a plant? When is a tree more than a tree? Because they're always more than a plant and more yeah. than a tree. And the influence that they give us in our lives, it, um, we, I, I look around here in this garden 
and in every garden. And as I drive along, I, I just realized a few years ago that people don't see the world as I see it. They don't see the earth as I see it. I know that those grapevines over there are going to produce fruit. I know what they're going to look like in the fall. I know that when they're in the winter zone of their life, that what I can trim and what I can't, what mm -hmm. I should and shouldn't do. And I know how to seed things out. I, I just, it, it, it influences our lives so much. And, you know, you talk about some of these huge trees, even that recently in the, in the storms have blown over and what, um, what they've been through yeah. and what experiences they are, who's climbed in them, who sat under them and, and enjoyed a picnic or enjoyed the shade or took a nap or, and what, what gift that tree is to us, what gift those plants are. I see parallels between nature and life because it's kind of intermingled. And the fact that these trees are bending, you know, and that they're surviving, and some of these old trees have been through a lot, they've seen a lot. There's, there's a little poem that you say that I just absolutely love. Do you mind sharing that for me? The name of the poem is either adversity or good timber, depending on which source you look at. Yeah. But it, it goes like this. The tree that never had to fight for sun and sky and air and light, but lived out in the open plain and always got its share of rain, never became a forest king, but lived and died a scrubby thing. The man who never had to toil to gain and farm his patch of soil, who never had to win his share of sun and sky and light and air, never became a manly man, but lived and died as he began. Good timber does not grow with ease. The stronger wind, the stronger tree, the further sky, the greater length, the more the storm, the more the strength. By wind and rain and sun and cold, in trees and men, good timbers grow. Where thickest lies the forest growth, we find the patriarch of both. And they hold counsel with the stars, where broken branches show the scars of many winds and much of life. This is the common law of life. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. My father taught me that poem. When I was young, he would recite poems, and I asked him to teach them to me. And I have all these poems handwritten by him. Really? And we would get together and we would memorize them. Oh, my heavens. Now that's such a legacy. Objects with stories are treasures remembered. It's time now for a visit with Dr. Micah Christensen. With me today, Dr. Micah Christensen, and we're here at Anthony's Fine Art. In the uh, medieval times, if you were a king or a queen, you would take this cabinet part, and this is the stand part, throughout your country, and it would use your laptop. It would have your seals, your legal documents, and you'd dispense justice, and you'd, 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 you'd rule on laws with the use of your cabinet on a stand. And then over time, that became a symbol of royalty itself, just the piece of furniture did. This is an elaborate one that was made in Burgos, Spain. So okay. if you're from Burgos, you are automatically bourgeoisie. The exterior wood is walnut that is intricately carved with religious symbols. On the bottom, we have the faces here are the authors of the four Gospels, Matthew, oh. Mark, Luke, and John. Gotcha. And then on the top, we have a higher level of, of carving. You have Christ on the cross, surrounded by his disciples, and then you have the descent from the cross that um, would have been part of the Catholic ritual of the discussion of the Eucharist. This elaborate lock, you lift it up, and then you take these two locks off the edge, and you pull out these supports, and you lower it down and, wow, color. Here we have a man looking like a gardener standing in front of a woman who's on her knees. Now, in early translations of the Latin uh, Vulgate Bible, when Christ was resurrected, Mary Magdalene thought he was the gardener ah, when okay. she saw him. So in, in, in these kinds of late medieval depictions, Christ was carrying the tools of a gardener.
This blue is a beautiful, beautiful blue. What would that, that be? That is the richest pigment of all. That material is lapis lazuli. Oh, yeah. In, in Italian, they call it ultramarine, which literally means beyond the sea, because it came from Afghanistan. The um, green is a copper derivative. Okay. The white is lead. And there's outlining you see on all of the figures, and that's gold. Wow. This here is ivory okay. that would have come from Africa in this 15th century by way of Portugal. So the person who owned this piece would have had the body or the case made by the best workers carving in, in Spanish walnut, doing Spanish iron work in Toledo, which is another part of Spain, the plaques imported from Limoges, France, and then the ivory which was taken from Africa brought through Portugal. This would have been almost a ritual object to the family, a kind of altar. They would have used it for everyday business. Mm -hmm. This would have probably had leather on it and you would have stood and done your work on it. Mm -hmm. And they would have kept important relics that were either acquired by the family or that were things like strands of hair, there were locks of hair that would have been taken from deceased members of the family. Okay, so you are saying this was made pre-Columbus. That's right. It's likely that we're only the third owners of this piece that's over 600 years old. What an incredible provenance. Well, you know, everyone has a story. Objects with a story are treasures remembered. From connecting with cave art to creating videos on your kids' or grandkids' devices, it's all about connection. Connection with people we know and love. Want to know the power of a story? We asked Mara. It's priceless. It's priceless to me because I, when I was first sitting with the guys listening to their stories, it's something you just can't get back. And there's a lot of stories I wish I would have had recorded from my dad, my mom, my grandparents. So at least we were able to get these stories recorded and to have them uh, videoed and digitized is key because the younger generation, you know, sitting with my nephews, doing homework with them uh, over COVID, they weren't looking at books, they were looking at screens, and they can look at this on a screen. I'm Doug Jessup. And I'm Nisha Vagaring. It would be our honor to help tell your family heritage story. Go to our website to schedule an in-studio interview on the Jessup's Journal TV set. Broadcast audio, video, and lighting are already set up to ensure quality control. All you need to do is come to our Salt Lake City studio and we'll do the rest. Our professional editing staff will take out bloopers and add your pictures to create a private digital video for your devices. Go to FamilyHeritageStories.com for pricing and to schedule your interview. It's our honor to be able to help people remember where they came from. If stories aren't passed down from generation to generation, the stories are lost, and it's as though those people never existed. So how do you want to be remembered? With another episode of Family Heritage Stories, I'm Nisha Degaring. And I'm Doug Jessup.